this little verse, the Lord has promised good to me. His word I hold secure. He will my shield and portion me. Oh, as long as life endures, wherever you are, live. Worship the Lord. We're thankful this morning, Jesus, for your goodness. Hallelujah. Your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Glory. Hallelujah. Lord, God, oh. 
right where you are this morning, lift your hands to heaven. Hallelujah. Jesus, we give you glory and honor today. We thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that again we can come together, Lord God, though we may be separated by distance because your spirit lives within us, Lord God. We can be one body, one church. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the one head. We ask that he receive all the glory, all the power, all the praise this evening. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Good evening, friends of the Augusta Assembly, and more importantly, friends of the Lord. Before we start tonight, I just had to share with uh, Philip as I came in here. I was like, well, that close, maybe about a foot and a half close to getting hit by another car on the way here as an individual get their car hung up on the side of the road right after the, the, uh, the on-ramp to I-20, and there was a couple of police cars there, and I saw the, it looked like a woman with an umbrella, and what I think was maybe her husband or somebody she knew did not look like a police officer in the vehicle trying to get it hung off of the, the curb as it all of a sudden flew off, and as I was coming toward it, it was all of a sudden coming toward me, but thankfully, there was another police car in between the two of us, and it crashed into the police car. So I'm sure the city of uh, Columbia County Sheriff's Office will be doing some repairs there, but thank God I'm here on time. So tonight, we're going to review the book of the prophet of Joel. I hope that you're enjoying these studies. I hope that you're able to take some notes, and I hope that, more importantly, that you are also reading and studying on the days and nights that we're not meeting together. And so we're going to look at the book of Joel, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the following weeks. And Joel is going to be an interesting read. It, it's often categorized, so I'll give you some information up front like I have been doing. And so if you're just joining us now, we've gone through the book of Obadiah. Um, we're looking at the book of Job. And next week, we're going to go into the book of Jonah. We're, we're taking some time, so uh, we'll go through uh, these books in, in one night. And then pretty soon we're going to hit the books of, of Amos and Hosea, and we'll take a little bit longer time. But we're going to we're, we're capturing a little bit about the prophet, a little bit about the book, a little bit about the time, and then trying to understand what was going on in the nation or around the prophets. What was the environment and the atmosphere that God was speaking? What was he saying? And then as important, maybe even slightly more important, what is God saying to us? through these prophets of the Old Testament today. Now, Joel is often categorized within the category of the expectation of na national restoration. And we find that also with the prophets Hosea and Amos. And so we'll study Amos next and then follow by Hosea, and you'll see that expectation of na national restoration, the restoration of the nation. Like Obadiah in the group of prophets that were mentioned last week, and if you were not able to listen, I'm sure you can go on our website and you can find the, uh, the YouTube videos. That's one of the good things that's happened uh, through this uh, uh, pandemic that we've had is God has had to make us become more creative and be able to, to reach out a little bit further. But last week we mentioned uh, Obadiah being with a group of prophets, much like Joel, in the pre-exilic period meaning they prophesied between the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, also known collectively during that period as Judah, were taken into captivity by Babylon. Now, once again, it's helpful to remember the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms in 920 B.C., with ten northern tribes, thenceforth known as Israel, and two southern tribes, thenceforth known as Judah. Joel prophesied to the people of to God's people in Judah, from Judah, during the reign of Joash in 832 to 796 B.C. There are some that, that have the dates a little bit different, but most scholars place him during the reign of Joash, and I'll, I'll show why in just a moment. And so that was well before the, the, uh, um, the first tribes were taken into captivity. So they had already divided in 920 B.C., and in, in, seven, in Joel prophesied in 832 to 796 B.C. Uh, during the reign of Joash during that time. And in 720 B.C., the ten northern tribes were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. 
followed in 586 B.C. when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Now, to understand that time and what's going on, and it'll be important for us to understand, Joash, the king that ruled during that time, was crowned at the tender age of seven after Athaliah, the only woman to rule in Judah, was slain with the sword at the Lord's house. Joash reigned 42 long and righteous years during the time of the ministry that Joel uh, prophesied. That was the, the king Joash. Joash is responsible for repairing the kingdom, the temple of God, and restoring worship to the Lord in Jerusalem. Leading with Joash was the priest uh, uh, Jehoiada. Jehoiada was a godly priest who led the people of God to rise up amidst great conflict and consternation. I suggest that if you're looking at a very attractive and active account of a portion of Israel history, check into the time captured in 2 Kings chapter 11 and 2 Chronicles chapter 23. Some very exciting, very active things happened during that time uh, that led up to the reign of Joash. In fact, all of Joash's siblings were all killed, only he was spared. I won't tell you how, you're going to have to read in 2 Kings chapter 11 or 2 Chronicles chapter 23. Under the reign of Joash and following the covenant that Jehoiada made between the Lord and the king, the people, uh, in, the, in the people, there was a great revival. The people went to the house of Baal, and they broke down the altars and the images. Related to the book of Joel, it, there's an interesting lack of reference to a king, yet there are references to uh, ruling elders and the priests. This is why most scholars suggest that the book was written during the time when Joash was still very, very young. Remember, again, he was brought into all his siblings had died, and Athaliah, the wicked woman, uh, uh, she, she was killed. And so Joash then took the crown at the age of seven. And so during that time, although he was king, he was really not ruling, he was not leading. Uh, he, he, and so it, it's during that time, the lack of a mature adult king, uh, you, you would uh, have expected to, to hear of the king but since we don't, we think it was when Joash was still very young. It is into this history, a, a great things of God had happened, a revival, um, um, the, the, the priest uh, making a covenant between uh, the king and the people with God, and a great revival starting out. This is the atmosphere uh, in, where a strong priestly voice of Jehodio was was leading a uh, spiritual revival concurrent with the resurgence of God's people starting to rebuild. They were giving to rebuild the kingdom. And here's where we encounter Joel. Now, it's going to be interesting because you would think on a high note like that, the people must have been pleasing God. But we're going to find out that just because something may be true on the outside, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true on the inside. And God has to get the people's attention. And he used this man whose name is Joel. Joel's name means Jehovah is God. And so Jo or, or Jehovah and El, like we think of the word El, Elohim, God. And so literally when Joel would introduce himself and say, my name is Joel, it's not like it translates and it means that Jehovah is God. He would be saying, Jehovah is God, which in his language is the word Joel, or Joel. And he was the son of Pethuel, as evidenced in Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1, verse 1, disputes a belief that some scholars have written that they believe that this Joel was, was one of the sons of Samuel. Um, that, is, that is discounted by the very first verse in the first chapter. Joel directed his prophecy to Jerusalem and Judah in the south where the temple and the priests were located. His message was one of impending judgment on Jerusalem and yet of blessing. So again, there was this great seeming revival. There was, there was giving in order to build the kingdom. On the outside, there seemed, they seemed to be a people after God's heart. But again, what we see on the outside is not necessarily an indicator of what's on the inside. 
In fact, Joel has two messages. One is of judgment and one's of blessing. One's of the day of the Lord, judgment, and one is the coming of the Spirit of the Lord in blessing. And we're going to go through and use that division. The book of Joel is the second oldest prophetic book in the Bible. It presents Christ as the one who gives the Holy Spirit in chapter 2, verse 28. It presents Christ as one who judges the nations in chapter 3, verses 2 and verses 12. And he presents Christ as the one who is the, the refuge and stronghold for his people in chapter 3, verse 16. It's noteworthy that while the Christian Bible has three chapters for the book of Joel, the book of Joel in the Jewish scriptures, the Tanakh, actually has four chapters. And I'll just reference where that, that chapter division is. Otherwise, it's the same book. These two messages result in further two divisions. So we'll break it up into four s separate areas. And so if you're taking notes from chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 17, is the desolation from the Lord. This is their desolation from the Lord. This is the account. This is, this is what they have done wrong. This is Joel pronouncing that there is judgment because of their desolation from the Lord. And then in chapter 2, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 21, Joel gives the blessing in the deliverance of the Lord. And so first, their desolation from the Lord, and then Joel will follow up with their deliverance of the Lord. And so looking first at their desolation from the Lord and breaking that down into two further parts, we'll start first with the historical aspects of Joel, which is really Joel chapter 1, verses 1 through, through 20. It's not uncommon for a prophet to have both a near view, the immediate historical situation, and a far view, future application in his message. In fact, that's what makes these, these uh, books of prophecy so important to us. Now, I would submit that most, if not all, of the books of the Bible have an immediate historical situation. They mean something and meant something to the people there. But it also has an application, a future application in our time uh, that's important as well. But the books of prophecy have something that's even beyond that, where some things are still yet to be fulfilled in our lives as well. And so we'll begin with the near view, and I'm going to spend some time reading some verses, and other times I'll just summarize them. But we're going to start by looking at the first four verses, because it opens the book of Joel and helps us to understand that while all those great things were going on and it seemed like Israel was on its way or actually the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, known therefore as Judah, were, were headed towards revival, something significant had just happened that Joel addresses. So Joel chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath, hath left, the, the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Joel's opening seems to indicate that there was a literal plague that had just swept through the land, a plague of unrelenting locusts. Now, what's interesting is he starts off and he asks the old men, listen to me, and all you inhabitants of the land, have in all of your days, even of the days of your father, have, have, has anything like this ever happened? Now, if you're younger and something happens and you turn to somebody older and say, wow, can you believe this is happening? Most times, probably 99 out of 100 times, that older person will say, well, back in my day, I remember. Because, you know, we had to walk uphill to school, five miles, uphill both ways with no shoes. And so in the sleet and in the rain and in 112 degree temperature, at the same time, which is difficult, you have never seen it snow in 120 degree temperature. But there's always like this one-upsmanship. But what happened here is so severe that, that he's, he's asking them because he knows it's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. No matter how old you are, you've never seen something this, this, this tremendous, this catastrophic. 
In fact, he even predicts that, that the people that are there, he says, you're going to have to tell this to, to your children, who will tell it to their children, who will tell it to their children and even a generation after, because nothing this significant and severe and catastrophic is even, even going to happen in all of their lifetimes. There was a tremendous plague of locusts that had come. Some, some scholars think that these are four different types of locusts. Others believe that these were the locusts in their various stages. It really doesn't matter. It, it was after one had done the damage that they could do, whatever was left, the next one came and was able to further damage. And it just got worse and worse and worse and worse, so there was nothing left. Now, we normally don't think of locusts. If you think of locusts and a plague of locusts, right away many of us are thinking of, oh, is it Charlton Heston and, you know, the, in, the, in Moses' time and all that was going on. Um, but there's some interesting things for us to understand that have never lived in that environment uh, about the, the sheer mass and destruction a plague of locusts can overcome. So locusts, when, when, they, when they fly, when they move, they can cover an area uh, in, of size of about 5 by 10 miles. During plagues, desert locusts may may spread over an enormous area of some 30 million square kilometers, extending into parts of up to 60 countries. This is more than 20% of the total land surface of the world. During plagues, desert locusts, they have the potential to damage the livelihood of a tenth of the world's population as they can mass some 30 to 80 million per square kilometer. They cluster closely like a military in formation. And when they fly, they actually sound like gusts of wind. And at night when they rest, if you're in the area, all you can hear is this crunching sound as they eat. And so they're sometimes called the incarnation of hunger. And some of them can grow to over 10 inches in length. Female locusts don't even need a male to progenerate. Desert locusts lay pods holding between 100 to 1,000 eggs in each pod. Some will lay pods up to three times a year, in their, or three, three different times in their three to five month lifespan. Others have been known to lay as many as 250 to 300 pods, again, of up to 100 to 1,000 eggs in each one. When they hatch, they can form swarms of upwards of 80 million per square kilometer. In Cyprus, it's, it was written that in order to prevent a large hatching, because they, they, they bury their pods of eggs in the ground, and sometimes they can sit dormant for a long time. And so in Cyprus, to prevent that, that, that large number from hatching, they, were, they dug them all up, and they dug up upwards of, uh, of 1,300 tons of eggs, just a massive amount. And so when this mass of locusts came and ate all of their food, in fact, they'll even get into the house and they'll eat leather. So a lot of things that we have are made out of fabrics or cloth. Well, back then they were very agricultural. So a lot of their things were made out of leather. The locusts would come in and consume them as well. In the face of this great calamity, an exhortation for God's people is to follow as he follows him. In verses 5 through 12, Joel begins calling individuals. So let's look at that. He says, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. So he calls out to, to the drunkards first, who sobriety is going to be a new thing. Because what the locusts have eaten, there's no more vine. There's no more vineyards. There's no more grapes. There's no more wine. For nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath cheek teeth of a great lion. So it's almost like a lion comes in and devours. These locusts have just eaten everything. He hath laid my, wine, my vine waste and barked my fig tree. They even eat the bark off the trees. So what they don't consume and if they leave anything, often it's left in such disrepair and ill health that it just dies. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. And so he, 
He says that the, 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 the emotional pain that is being suffered by these people who have seen just, it looks like the face of the moon. There's just nothing left. It's just everything that was live, all the vines, all the trees, all the grass, everything is just gone. It's just a wasteland. And, and the, the heavy uh, lament that falls upon them would be just like a, 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 uh, an individual. So back in, during the time of, of the nation of, of Israel, they would betroth husbands and wives together, so almost like they're engaged for upwards of a year. And at that point, even though they're engaged, they would consider themselves married but not yet consummated. And so there's an expectation when, that, when the final ceremony is done and they're, they're finally husband and wife, but just before that happens, the husband dies. And so just the, the heartfelt agony of the virgin uh, girded in sackcloth because the husband of her youth has died. And he goes on to, to talk about the meat and the, and, the, and the drink and all of these things. And so he calls the, the, the drunkards, he calls the husbandmen, he calls the vine dressers of the ravished fields laid waste. And he calls for them to awake, to lament, and to be ashamed. When's the last time there's been a call for God's people to awake, to lament, and to be ashamed? Have we not had need? Have we not been called? Or we, have we not listened for the word of the Lord? When's the last time you've awakened, you've lamented, and you've been ashamed? Moving on, Joel then turns in chapter 13 to the spiritual leaders. So he talked to the drunkards. The, the, the espoused virgin, the husbandmen, the vine, the vine uh, keepers, the, the farmers. In verse 13, he then turns to the spiritual leaders and says, Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. So he's calling him. Normally, the nation of Israel, when they had sinned, and they had trespassed against the Lord. In order to, uh, uh, to make amends, they would, they would have a sacrifice. They would have offerings, but they had nothing left. They could not make their meal offering. They could not present anything because there was nothing left. So then he calls for them to sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. When I read that, all of a sudden I started thinking, and I started down a path, and it was like God gave me whiplash to turn in the other direction. So Joel cries out to the ministers. He calls out to the priests, and then he call, cries out on their behalf to sanctify a fast. And, I, and I'm thinking, so it's not hard to fast when you have no food. That, that doesn't sound like it would be a hard thing. We, we will call a solemn assembly because... We have nothing left. There's no farm to go out. There's no work to be done because everything is desolate now. So we might as well just assemble ourselves. And we might as well say I'm fasting because I'm not eating because I have no food. But then the whiplash I got is, is God dropped in my heart that some of these people likely had some rations that they had held on to. They had some food maybe that, that they had stored away that the locusts hadn't gotten to. They had some things that were maybe settled aside that the locusts weren't able to touch. The problem was that they don't have the same type of ingredients and preservatives that we have today that will extend how long those things will keep. They didn't have refrigerators and freezers back then to just say, I'll keep it in the freezer. So I'll go ahead and fast because that'll just prolong the times that I will eat. Instead of eating everything up in this next week, I'll fast a little bit, then I'll eat a little bit, then I'll fast a little bit, and it'll last longer. No, my friend, if they didn't consume it, it was likely to go bad. And so he was calling them to step aside, to walk away even from that, that they had their safety, and to fast even if it meant that you would lose and it would spoil the things that you had left. Call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land unto the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. 
The nation had befallen a national calamity. And Joel calls out to the nation and then the spiritual leaders. Humility and holiness are called for at a national level because this was not merely a natural disaster, as Joel next points out. So in verse 15, Joel goes on and says, Alas, the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under their clods. The garnishes are laid waste. The barns are broken down. The corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The the herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of the sheep are made desolate. And so now God is shaking up his people. Joel calls out to the common people. Joel then calls out to the priests and the ministers. They then call out upon everybody to stop, to fast, to have a uh, a solemn uh, gathering. And then God calls out, alas for the day, the day of the Lord is at hand. God is shaking up his people. Not only had the locusts consumed all the plants and the trees, the seed that was planted, it rotted instead. The herds groan and are perplexed. Their current sufficiency was consumed by the locust, and their future sufficiency was rotted in the ground. And so Joel then opens a vision to the day of the Lord. I'll give you some homework. I won't tell you how many, but go search how many times Joel mentions the day of the Lord in the book of Joel. Now, the day of the Lord is also mentioned in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Very interesting because a lot of times the locusts, their eggs would be buried in the ground, and they would be buried there for days and weeks and sometimes years. They have some these strange plague and locusts that just seem to be buried forever. Then all of a sudden, as if one day they weren't there, and overnight they just came out, and the next morning they're swarming and they're devouring, almost like they came as a thief in the night. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, actually it starts with, well, let me read verse 10 first. Peter also writes, and he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, just as the locust again arose quickly and appeared the next morning, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt up with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein should be burned up. I heard of a pastor who was so so overwhelmed as he was preaching this that he talked about that the heavens would pass away, there'd be a great noise, and even the elephants would melt. Actually, it's elements. And so the verse right before that is telling, however, because Peter is describing to the people that are waiting for the Lord and the Lord hasn't come. And he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. So there's a promise that he's waiting, that God is waiting. He's not slack. He's waiting patiently that the most people, that the last people should come to the Lord, and then the day of the Lord shall come. So back to Joel. In spite of of what had happened to the land, and the rivers were dried up, and the pastures were dried out, and and the flame of the Lord, it says, devoured the vineyards and the trees and the pastures. Now, what's interesting is some believe that that was um, a lightning that had hit, and because the the locust had eaten so much and that it was very arid, it just dried out, and so the, the, the slightest spark, the slightest amount of heat caused it to catch fire and it just burned up. Another, other um, scholars uh, remind us that sometimes as the locusts, because sometimes they come in waves, and so you'd see some of them that would come out and they, they, would, they would be born, and they would start eating from the ground, and then they would start flying around, 
and then another wave would be born. And so they would try to interrupt that by just setting fire to everything, thereby burning all of the, the baby locusts and some of the eggs as well. And so what the locusts left was devoured by fire. In times like this, when national disaster strikes, where's our focus? We're going through some times here. Where's our nation's focus? Last week I spoke about cautioning us when others of other opinions or those that are of a different camp or a different belief or even what we would consider to be our adversaries or even our enemies, when they fail to not look glibly upon them. That was the pride of the Edomites. There's just as much danger looking internally in depression or looking for where your salvation's going to come, where your help's going to come, where your refuge is going to come. Is your focus inward? Do you find yourself blaming yourself when calamity befalls you or those around you? Do you often default to assuming that your actions or inactions have caused God to declare a punishment that has befallen you and those around you as cosmic unintended casualties? It was all your fault, but they're just collateral damage? Or is your focus outward? Do you find yourself blaming others when calamity befalls you or those around you? Do you often default to assuming that the reason why this is happening is because the actions of those that hold different beliefs, whether they're political or spiritual? That's why God is doing this. God is punishing us because of them. And declare, that's, he's declared a punishment. It's befallen those around us which are now included within this cosmic unintended casualties. We just happen to be collateral damage. Maybe instead of placing our focus inward or outward, our focus should be upward. This is the shift to the prophetical aspect of Joel in the second half of his first message. We pick it up in chapter 2, verses 1 through 17, with the, the prophetical aspect of Job's message. So knowing that what had befallen God's people, the prophet Joel seeks to snap their attention from their now to their immediate future. Sometimes we get so caught up in what's happening, we look at the circumstance. God's trying to get our attention at the immediate future, just beyond that. And so Joel chapter 2 starts off with, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at thy hand. These literal locusts of the past that had just ravished the nation that Joel was in are now used as a picture of the invading north army of the future. Joel warns of the impending day of darkness and gloominess, one with a day of clouds and thick darkness. Note that Joel says, the day of the Lord cometh. And so we know it's a future thing. Yet he also says, it is nigh at hand. If you do a study of the day of the Lord, you'll find out that it is all of the eschatological future that, that we have. It begins with the rapture of the church. It continues on through the tribulation. It continues on through, God's, through Christ's second coming. It goes on through the millennial kingdom. It goes on after the millennial reign. To the, to the judging of the nations, to the, the great throne judgment, all of that is part of the day of the Lord. And so he notes that the day of the Lord is coming. And they've been saying that since the Old Testament. They were saying that in the New Testament. But yet, it is nigh at hand. We are to prepare as if we will live for another century. But we're to live each day, each moment, like the Lord could appear at the next heartbeat. Let me say that again. We're to prepare. We should prepare as if we're going to be here for another century. That's what our preparation should be. But we should live like the Lord will appear at our very next heartbeat. So fully prepared, but always ready. Joel says a devouring fire will, be go, will go before them and behind them, leaving them as an inescapable, desolate wilderness. He continues on in verse 3 and he, in, in verse 4 and he talks about their adversaries will be as an army of chariots sweeping across the mountaintops and they who attempt to escape 
will be much pained. Continue on through verses 5, 6. And as you read this, as I read this, and I challenge you, hopefully you've been reading through this. If not, maybe you'll give it one more read uh, tonight and tomorrow night. In my mind's eye, I see this army appearing as a veil flowing across the mountains and the valleys and consuming all in their way. So heavy and powerful veil that the earth and the heavens tremble and shake, and even the moon and the stars are darkened in its presence. In verse 11 it says, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his enemy, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? I'll tell you, that's a rhetorical question. No man, no woman, no living thing can abide the day of the Lord. The destruction described in verses 1 through 11 now are juxtaposed to an appropriate contrition commanded in verses 12 through 17. So as you read of the, descri- the destruction that's descri- described in those first 11 verses, and now it's juxtaposed with the appropriate contrition commanded in verses 12 through 17. Listen. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Joel calls for the people to repent, to turn to the Lord with their heart, to fast, to mourn. Again, these, this nation that from the outside looked like they were heading for revival, looked like they were preparing to build the temple. They were starting to give it the offerings. All of the outside things. And, and Joel speaks the word of God, which says to, to tear your heart, not your garments. It's an inside thing, not an outside thing. And turn to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of evil. Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? And again in verse 15, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a holy or solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. This is so important. They had just got married and were about to, to, to start their honeymoon. The honeymoon comes to a full stop, full halt, and they're to come out. Verse 17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porches and the altar and let them say, spare the people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is God? Joel's not above trying to even call God's attention to his own pride. If not for their sake, Lord God, then for your sake, because they'll look at your people and what's happening to them and say, where is their God? It's a powerful message. Remember, this is to a people with godly priests leading a revival. And he's telling them to fast, to assemble, to weep, to make place for God. And so now we, we, we halfway through and we get to the second division. So we've went from their um, desolation from the Lord. And now we look at the deliverance of the Lord in chapter 2, verse 18, through the remainder of the book. Further broken down also into two parts. The prophet moves to good news. Deliverance from the destruction will come, both to the people in the present and to the people in the future. Joel begins with the promise of present blessings in chapter 2, verse 18 to 27. God will be jealous for his land and have pity on his people. The land would produce corn and grapes again, and the people would have meal and wine and, and be able to not only consume them for themselves, but also to use them as an offering unto the Lord. The Lord will drive the rival army back, and the land will rejoice. The trees will produce. The beasts of the field will be set at ease. 
And the children of Zion would be glad and rejoice in the Lord their God. The Lord will cause to come down, it says, for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And in verse 24, the floors shall be full of wheat. So they just went from being ravished by these locusts that left nothing. And if anything of stubble was even left, it, it had caught fire. It was like the face of the moon, nothing. But God was telling them that the floors shall be full of wheat again. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I, says the Lord, will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else in my people shall never be ashamed. God doesn't punish us to shame us. God tries to get our attention. God's a jealous God. And so following the plagues, it says, Joel says that God will send a plentiful harvest. The northern enemy will be removed and restoration will come from God to his land. And his people shall never again be put to shame. Finally, Joel concludes with the promise of future blessing. Verse, or chapter 2, verse 28 through 321. Here is where we see a major shift in Joel's prophecy. In the Jewish scriptures, this is the break in chapters and introduces the third and fourth chapters. So chapter 3 in the Jewish Bible starts where our chapter 2, verse 28 is. And it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit Upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in, the, in those days will I pour out my spirit. This shift that Joel speaks of is actually fulfilled at Pentecost when God poured out his spirit upon the people in a revival. And since that day, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Joel now speaks of a restoration of Judah that far exceeds even Judah itself and is made available to you and I today. He goes on to say, And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord to come. So Joel talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit and he also talks about the day of the Lord and these, the, the day that shall come. And it shall come to pass during this time, that time, and the time to come that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant of who the Lord shall call. Our Christian Bible now moves to chapter 4 as the Jewish scriptures move to chapter, or ours to chapter 3, there to chapter 4. In verse 1 it says, For behold, in those days and in that time shall I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, and I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they might drink drinks. This goes back to the promise that God will bless them that bless them. He will bless the nations that bless Israel and curse the nations that curse Israel. And so that's a promise that we have. Those that destroy, those that continued to put their hands on Israel, that, that would cast lots for their people and treat them as, as, as things to be traded. In the years past, and even today, as people look and try to cast lots in how they would divide up the nation of Israel to have two nations or, or, or give some of their land away, not realizing and recognizing that that's the people of God and that's the land promised to God's people. From the restoration of, of Judah, Joel now moves to the condemnation of Judah's enemies. Yea, 
And what have I to do to thee, O Tyre and Zidon and all the coasts of the Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return to your recompense upon your own head? He goes on to talk about the nations of Tyre and Zidon. Specifically, they're called out, as are the coastline of, of Palestine. The terrible crimes they committed upon the children of Judah, stealing silver and gold and pleasant things from the temple of the Lord, as well as selling the children of Jerusalem to the Grecians, that they might be removed far from their lands. All of that would be recompensed upon their own heads. They would see a day when their own sons and daughters would be sold from them, even to a people far off, because the word of the Lord says, for the Lord hath spoken it. And next, Joel moves to a future proclamation of the nations in preparation of the final battle, Harmageddon. Verse 9, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hook into spears, let the weak say, I am strong. Now we see that antithesis in the scripture, and I believe it's at the United Nations as well, where they are to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Take your instruments of war and turn them into instruments of peace. But here God says in this particular time, for this particular circumstance, that they are instead to beat their plowshares into swords and the things of peace like their pruning hooks into implements of war like spears. And let the weak say, I am strong. He goes on to say in verse 11, Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about, Thither cause my mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge the heathen round about. Now it's interesting and and important to understand what is happening here to be able to understand uh, a verse that's coming up. So he he says to, to bring them all to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There, he says, will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. And he says in verse 13, Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full. The the fats overflow, and their wickedness is is great. So he's he's speaking as you would take grapes, and you would put them into a vat until it's completely full, and then you would begin to turn it, and you would begin to press, and you would begin to get the the juice that would come out of that. he, He says that it is so plump, those grapes and bursting forth as that wickedness is. And then verse 14, where it says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their their shining. Joel's message, I'll go back to that verse in just a minute. But for now, Joel's message ends with the climax of salvation by the Lord. In verse 16, as the Lord also shall roar out of Zion, because he is of the mighty tribe of Judah, the roaring lion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of Israel. When your world shakes, when your circumstances shake, where's your hope? What do you reach for? Joel says that the Lord is the hope of his people, and the strength of the children of Israel. God's people were to blow the trumpet in Zion, to sanctify a fast, to call a solemn assembly, and the Lord would then respond and roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. In verse 17, So shall ye know that I am the Lord, your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall be no stranger pass through her any more. It shall come to pass in that day, this is a promise of the future, that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and the fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall the waters of the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. 
Joel ends to a people that are still facing their land like the face of the moon, that a plague of locusts had destroyed and fire had consumed, and even the promise of the future greenery and vegetables and fruits and harvest, the seed that was buried in the ground rotted underneath the dirt by which it was clotted. And with anticipation and joy and excitement, he tells them that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and the fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. So to them, that was such a great promise, something that they were waiting for. Like many of you may be waiting for the day that we can just stop social distancing and be able to get out and to see one another and not have to wear masks and gloves and all of those things. If you can think of the strongest desire that you have to be able to get beyond this circumstance and the situation that we're currently in, it should pale to the desire that you and I should have to have a deeper daily Walk with the Lord. So as you think of a parallel of anything that's, that's in your way, that's preventing you from being able to go out and to socialize and to, to, to have relationships with your friends, those things should pale in the face as you take account for the things in your life that may be getting in your way from being able to get deeper and deeper with the Lord. Because the situation, the circumstances that we're in today, they won't stop that. The only thing that stops your relationship and my relationship from going deeper with the Lord is you or I. No one else can take that away from you. And no situation and circumstance can stop that. Because before this this endemic, this plague, this coronavirus broke out, was God. And now that it has broken out, that same God is the same yesterday, today. And even if this thing should come to pass, He's the same God tomorrow. And we have the same ability to relate with Him and to grow deeper with Him. Joel teaches us that God's judgment is always eminent. The nation from all appearances from the outside, was on the verge of this great revival, rebuilding the temple. Everyone was giving. And all of a sudden, because their hearts were not right, they were renting their garments and doing things on the outside. But God had to call them to rent their hearts. Judgment is always imminent. And future judgment is always ultimate. While the key verse maybe chapter 2, verses 2 through 29, it says, In the day, and it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants of the Lord and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. That's often, in fact, I've got that written in, in my Bible right here. Chapter 2, verse 28. The message of Joel that I want us to focus on as we conclude for the night is actually in chapter 3, verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And You know, I had misunderstood that for a long time. In fact, I've, I've used that verse to preach. It, to me, it sounded like a great revival message or, or as I, I go out and, 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 and preach and teach and speak to others, as there are multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, that all of these people are just there. They're in a huge valley and just waiting for you and me to, to, to present the gospel. They're in the valley of decision. But that is not what it means at all. If you remember... When we look back a few verses, in verse 12, chapter 3, it says, Let the heathen be awakened and come into the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge, 
It's the Lord who is making the decision. And so as I studied that and looked at that more in context, literally, we can translate that to really mean tumult and confusion is in the valley of determination. These are not crowds of people looking towards God to make a decision for or against Him. These are a mass of the confused that God is looking upon as He makes a determination. In which the day of the Lord is akin in the valley of determination. God is there. So the question I have for myself and if I could be so bold for you as well. When God looks upon those that we have lived by and worked by and related with and spoken to and interacted with and had the ability to influence, what has our influence done to their lives? Are they ready for the Lord to look upon them and determine their eternal destination? Have we done everything we can so that when the Lord looks at him or her that we have interacted with and had the ability to share with and to pray to and to pray for, will their lives be right so that the determination of their eternal destination will be that God will gather them up? Have we impacted them in such a way that they too have called upon the Lord to be their Savior? Or have we left them in the valley confused, unknown, unknowing, unrelated to God, so that God would give the, the, the determination that he never knew them. This is something that I think we, in whatever situation and circumstance we're going through, how much more might we have an opportunity to be able to speak, speak to those around us and speak of our hope when the whole world seems to be shaking and trembling and even the, the sun and the moon and the stars seem not as bright as they used to be. Can we share where our hope is? Where our salvation is? When our world begins to shake, where we reach out to for comfort, for refuge, where we know our promise and our mercy and our grace flows from, have we shared that with those around us? God's giving us this opportunity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your message that is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We thank you, Lord God, that you challenge us, Lord God. You comfort us and console us, Lord God, but you challenge us. Help us, Lord God, to take that which you've given us, precious, and help it to change us, Lord God, that we can share it with those around us. That as you look and a determination is made, over each soul that we have had the opportunity and to come in contact with, to influence, that they have made the decision that you are their Lord, you are their Savior, you are their Master, that they might enter in to heaven with you for eternity. Father, we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we close again, as a reminder... We're going to be studying the book of Jonah next Wednesday, four easy chapters. Go ahead and read through those this week. Um, they're very easy. You can very easily get through the book of, of Jonah, um, read it once, twice, three times in a day uh, for the next couple of, uh, of days until next week. We're going to follow that by taking the book of Amos. We're going to break it up into two sections. We'll go through chapter 1 through 6, and then we'll conclude the following week in chapter 7 through 9. And then we'll hit the book of Hosea, and we'll actually break that into three different nights, 1 to 3, 4 to 8, 9 to 14. But for right now, just take some time, continue to read through, maybe read through one more time, maybe one more time tonight, even tomorrow morning, to look through Joel, and then turn to Jonah.
it, it'll be a blessing to, to see you again this Sunday. If you haven't been able to come here, we look forward to seeing you. We're looking forward to another Sunday from now, doing a soft opening. Remember, if you want to be able to come into the sanctuary, either up here and be able to sit with uh, social distance, but sit with your family members or downstairs, please get with the church uh, office uh, to make your reservations. Otherwise, we'll see you either outside uh, in our cars or we'll see you on, 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 on the network that God has given us. God bless you. God loves you. Go with God, and he'll go with you. Amen.